Hi, I'm Steve Murphy and welcome to the Insider Exclusive. Today, we have some breaking headline legal news about discrimination in the Los Angeles Fire Department and discrimination in the entertainment industry. Stay tuned. Even in 2007, a lot of individuals are singled out because of sex, yes. because of race. Uh, all of these things are things that stick out. My grandmother passed away when I was six, and I remember the first person, or first people there were firefighters. And right. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be someone that could be there for someone. What he realized over time is that everything that was happening to him wasn't happening to the other firefighters. Mm -hmm. All of these things that he's telling you about yeah. were only happening to him. It all leads back to their harassment and their buffoonery. They sent me an email. They said they scrapped the product, and then I found out that the project was going through. We'd look for cases that will make a positive difference. If you have a case where you were harmed by somebody else, call the cop. Today we're pleased to have with us the Cochran Firm discussing discrimination cases right here in the city of Los Angeles. We'll be talking about some cases against the Los Angeles Fire Department as well as in the Screen Acting Guild, the Hollywood industry, and the entertainment field. I want to welcome our guests to our show, Randy McMurray and Brian Dunn. Thank Thanks you for joining us with again. Okay. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. The Cochran Firm, well known for protecting the rights of the little people, the people that get passed over, the people that don't have the money to go up against agencies like the police department, like the fire department. You guys step in and help them, right? That's what we do. What kind of discrimination cases do you generally handle? And you can tell us a little bit about the background of the fire department cases, for example. Well, what we're looking for in every case is we're looking for the abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for a situation in which a person that has authority has power, has influence, is wielding that against a person that doesn't. In an and illegal way. In an illegal way. Yeah. And it's also in an immoral way. And I use the word morality because all of these cases strike us on the heart mm -hmm. as something that's wrong. Somebody is being treated badly. And what we see is, even in 2007, a lot of these individuals are singled out because of sexual orientation, right. uh, because of sex, Yes. Because of race, uh, all of these things are things that stick out. And when we see a person being treated, uh, not being treated as they should be, mm -hmm. uh, this raises a red flag. When the Cochrane firm sues someone for discrimination, what is the immediate thought that a lot of people think? Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like in the case in the Hollywood industry, you're right. representing a writer. We're actually going to have the writer on the show here. We are. Paul um, she wrote something. She wrote a uh, book or a script, right? Yes. That um, was actually stolen from her, more or less, right? More or less stolen. From her. Yeah. yeah. So wh that you're going to you're going up against all of these Hollywood producers. What's their initial reaction? Well, I think their their initial reaction is, how can we make this go away? Yeah. Um, the reaction in this case was to was a cover up and to change documents and alter contracts that right. were signed. Mm -hmm. So you, you have um, some um, unscrupulous people right. who are trying to take advantage of a young lady who did exactly what she, they asked her to do. Now the fire department, we've seen it in the news. It was a case settled recently here about a firefighter who ate uh, some food that was uh, tainted with dog food or something like that, right? What's, what's going on with the fire department? Well, what you're seeing is a pattern of discrimination that mm -hmm. is finally, just in recent times, coming to light. Mm -hmm. uh, the fire department had escaped the scrutiny uh, of many of the other government agencies because it's so small and because it is so independent. Uh, but what you're seeing is, specifically as it relates to the African American firefighters, they're being treated completely differently from the time that they are in the academy mm -hmm. on up through uh, the time in which they're evaluated uh, to actually be full-fledged firefighters. And we're seeing the pattern of discrimination happens from a very, very early time in their career. 
And it's quite shocking, some of the things that we're seeing. Okay, when you represent them, and they're suing their own employer, basically, how are they treated then? It takes a lot of courage yes. for them to do this, okay? Because essentially, they've got to fight two battles now. They've got to fight the battle uh, that any firefighter has to fight uh, in terms of getting into an elite organization. Yes. But they also have to fight this other fight. And this other fight is a fight that they're individually dealing with, uh, with somebody accusing them uh, of trying to play the race card. Yeah. Somebody accusing them of saying you want special treatment uh, because of your race. You want to be treated differently because right. of your race when really they just want to be treated like everybody else. You know, that's one of the reasons why I asked you what, is, what do they think when they're sued by the Cochrane firm. That's immediately what a lot of people think if you're playing the race card. Absolutely. Okay, But that's not really true, is it? No, it's not true. I, I mean, this is endemic in our society. So when right. you actually go before a jury, okay, do you address that immediately? This is not why we're suing. It depends on the case. And I'll tell you that what, you're, what you just brought up yeah. is something that is nationwide. Yes. Uh, we're living in an era now where uh, just the mere mention of race discrimination uh, brings out this reaction, which is, oh, you're trying to be a victim. Right. You're trying to get over. You're trying to do something that uh, is going to have you not taking responsibility. And that completely, that's a power dynamic that literally blames the victim for being a victim. Right. And that's the type of thing that we're seeing. We're seeing it in juries. So when we have a situation where this goes to trial, we have to kind of walk on eggshells. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing and what the juries are finding is that even though uh, these issues of race are not directly brought out, Right. The juries are able to read between the lines, Good. and that's why you're seeing the verdicts that you're seeing in these cases. Right. I remember when I interviewed Tom Mesereau, and he talked about this very same issue, you know, about race, and he addresses the issue right away, and you saw in the community where Michael Jackson was tried, you know, right. basically an all-white jury, right? They did the right thing because they didn't want to see the authorities overuse and abuse their, their power, right. which is what was going on. And you didn't make it into a race issue. Yeah. yeah. I am now going to bring some of these firefighters, one at a time, on the show so they can tell their story and tell what it's really like to fight these two battles, you know, one day-to-day -day and the other one against the employer. But we have, we have one case that the, the, the client is not going to be here, and she's an African-American, and she's gay, Yes. Um, and she's a woman. So she's got three strikes against her. Is she a firefighter, too? She was a firefighter. Yeah. Really? And so, they just basically drove her out because of these things? Because of all those things. She had three strikes against her. Wow. As far as the fire department is concerned. You know, it really, you hit the nail on the head. It takes a courageous person. It, does. it really does. Because you ask yourself, what did I do to deserve this? Right. I tried to work in the system. You know, you've got to be an elite person to get in the fire department. And all of a sudden, it's all turned against you. Right. Thank God you guys are fighting for them. Let's bring on the firefighters, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm pleased to have with me today one of the clients, Joe Ward Wallace. Nice Welcome to, to our you. show. And you represent him in this discrimination case, Brian, right? Absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about his particular case, and I'm going to ask you, Joe, you know, to tell it what it's like you know, at the fire department and what's really going on. What is the claim here? Well, essentially, our claim is that from the moment he signed up mm -hmm. with the department, he has been subject to an entirely different standard of scrutiny, an entirely different set of treatment. He's been treated entirely differently uh, because of his race. And his, his case is no different uh, than the case of many other African-American firefighters within the department. And I think that he can tell you, uh, in his own words, essentially what he's been through. Let me, before you get into that, let me ask you one question. I read, are there 3,900 firefighters in the Los Angeles Fire Department? Approximately. Okay. What percentage of them are African American, roughly? Approximately. Uh, approximately 11%, uh, I believe. 11%, so roughly, what, 400 or something like that. Do all of them have problems there, or are you finding this out, or what? Well, I'm finding out more... Yeah. As, the, as we get deeper into this case, uh, but there was a report sent out by the the, uh, the I guess it's the city controller, yes. Laura Chick, that uh, explained how most, if not you know, more than ninety percent of the African Americans that 
are on the department mm-hmm. had some sort of uh, discrimination act toward them yes. uh, or knew of someone that had one, right. an act against them or toward them. Now, you're still actively employed by... By the, the city. By the city, by the Los Angeles Fire Department. Yes. Although they're looking for a good job for you. Yes. You haven't found a good job because you've, you're injured, is right. that correct? Right. Um, what were some of the incidents that happened that you led you to the Cochran firm? Well, first, first of all, you know, starting at at the academy. Yes. Um, when when I first went to the academy, I noticed right away that there was a, a different kind of treatment for people of color. Yes. And uh, just you know, the survival instinct kicked in, and I decided, okay, let, I'm going to get as many of the people of color together so that we could study together and 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 practice outside of the academy right. because I knew that we were going to be scrutinized harder right. so we had to work harder right. and you know that was the first step of that and then after making it through there mm-hmm. okay through the academy graduating uh, uh, there was a few of them that got knocked out for various reasons and I, and I mean African Americans yeah. and, and other minorities um, uh, my first house I, I noticed right away that I was being treated, you know, worse than the other rookies that I was talking to that yes. were not African American. Would they give you jobs that they didn't give other people, or what? They 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 gave you they gave me uh, uh, just more, more work, more work than than I was hearing from others, and and, and ridiculous things they were asking me to do. So how yes. long did that go on? That went on my my entire stint. Uh, until I eventually ended up getting injured mm-hmm. by the f- buffoonery and harassment that they were doing. Right. Uh, they would ask me every time there was an alarm, mm-hmm. every time we got a call, to get dressed in my full gear as if we were going into a fire. Yeah. 80% of our calls are medical. Yes. Okay, I'm on a truck, which mm-hmm. is we are in attack mode. We're, right. we're supposed to fight fires. The There's different sections in the station. Yeah. And I was on the truck's part of it and if a if an, uh, there was a call for a medical this is it's a rescue unit that's supposed to go out yes they would have me they would time me sit there and time me get dressed in my full gear mm-hmm. and I wasn't even supposed to go out on that call mm-hmm. so that means every call that came to the station they would have Joe Wallace run and get his breathe be the be, uh, breathing apparatus and get in full gear right and it's just it was just excessive yeah. It, it, how how did you become injured? Um, I was a part of that. At the this, and I tell you that that that's one of the things that they did almost every day. Right. So eventually, by me donning my breathing apparatus, putting it on, my clavicle ripped out of my sternum. Wow. Came out of my sternum while I was throwing my breathing right. apparatus, and it just every doctor the the nine ten doctors that I talked to is just excessive. Uh, use in that area, yes, and it all leads back to their harassment and their buffoonery, mm-hmm. having me do crazy stuff like that. So you went on like a, a leave of absence. Uh, I'm leave. on a medical leave medical of absence. every. So in other words, I didn't even pass my probation period. Yeah, let me ask you this. Of, you know, um, a lot of people wouldn't do a courageous thing like you say. Look, at, I've been discriminated against. How, how long did it take you to get to Brian? Uh, it took me. It took me about. Uh, about a, a year, wow. I believe That's after wow. about a year, because you were unwilling to believe that you that know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to rock the boat, or I was still employed, and I was still just. I was just. I wanted to be a firefighter. Yeah. I've all. This is something I've always wanted to do, and they basically stole that dream from me. Yeah. By by their you know by the harassment. Right. That led to this injury. Yes. You know so. Um, he reached his breaking point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. This you're in, is not do you something, remember when he came in? I remember when he came in, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he had essentially reached his breaking point. Yeah. Uh, this is not the type of thing that he saw himself doing, uh, but what he realized over time is that everything that was happening to him wasn't happening to the other firefighters. Right. All of these things that he's telling you about yeah. were only happening to him. And as time went on, I believe he realized that he had to do something about it. Okay, well, I'm, I can tell you this, with the Cochran Firm, something's going to be done about it. Yeah, All right? Sure I and I want to thank you very much for coming in. Keep up the fight. You're going to win. Especially with Brian. He's going to win. Uh, right. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.
We are pleased to have with us another firefighter who has a discrimination case against the Los Angeles Fire Department. His name is Kevin Norwood. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You have kind of a unique case, don't you? Yes, I do. What happened that brought you to the Cochran firm? I was a recruit uh, for 17 weeks in the Los Angeles City Fire Department's Academy. Mm -hmm. um, the Academy length is 17 weeks. I was two days from graduation and I was terminated. And the reason? Uh, based on discrimination and the fact that um, my wife is Caucasian. Is that right? Now, Brian, you're representing Kevin, aren't you? I am. What are the allegations in the lawsuit that you have filed against the Los Angeles Fire Department? Well, specifically that he was subjected to a different standard of treatment yeah. uh, because of his color of his skin. Mm -hmm. uh, that he was treated differently uh, than the other recruits. Uh, we're seeing this you know, come up again and again. Uh, that he was the standards uh, to which he was subjected uh, were more rigorous. Yes. And that they were entirely different uh, than the standards uh, that he would have been subjected to uh, had he not been black. Right. Um, recently, or before the show, we talked about the Los Angeles Police Department, we talked about the Fire Department, right. and overall, they do a great job. Absolutely. But there are circumstances which need to be addressed, because overall, 100% uh, is not being happening for everybody. That's the truth. Um, your day-to-day -day experiences of discrimination, how would you describe them? Um, treatment wasn't fair throughout. I mean, you even look at the class. We were a group of like 52 guys to start out with, and you're supposed to be like a, you're supposed to represent a certain percentage of L.A. City, the, you know, the society and environment sure. which you represent. There were maybe eight of us in the class of 52, and if you do that ratio with L.A., you know, there's more than a third of sure, uh, absolutely. us in here well, in L.A. Well, you know, congratulations for getting in the academy to begin right. with. Right, and right. to begin with, I was, in that class, I was like the third highest ranked Okay. You know, guy going prior to the class. So prior to becoming a firefighter, had that been a dream of yours forever? Forever. I mean, my grandmother passed away when I was six, and yeah. I remember the first person, or first people there were firefighters. And right. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be someone that could be there for someone, you know, like they were there for my grandmother. Listen, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I hope there's a good resolution of this case for you. And I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. There's another discrimination case that the Cochran firm is handling right now in Hollywood, and it deals with a screenwriter, and her name is Paula Neiman. How are you? Hi. Welcome nice to the show. Thank you. Randy, tell us a little bit about her case and what happened here. Well, this is this is the case where there was um, a an idea came up for an audio Bible, uh, you know, a spoken word Bible, and the, the the original plan was to do the New Testament first. And they had there were the plan was to do it with an all African American all star cast, mm -hmm. uh, something brand new, uh, and the cast was gonna they they had these wonderful stars that were supposed they they were planning to put in it, and they had to have a product in which to sell. So um, the uh, the gentleman who came up with the idea had another guy who had was an entrepreneur, and he contacted Paula, who he had met um, at where she was working at at the time. And he got her, talked with her, and they decided that she would write the script and help with the production of this thing. And she would help him to develop the, the product that was going to be this wonderful audio Bible. And, and when they got her involved in it, she did all this work. She did a lot of research. She did a lot of writing. Um, she contacted people. She came up with ideas. Um, uh, she met with a, a, a Bible expert who could get her all of the character traits right. um, of the people in the Bible so she could actually put some feeling into the script. Mm -hmm. And um, they found out that because she got a piece of the action, uh, that was a little too much for them, and they decided that they'd cut her out. And so um, she came to us, and we'll fix it for her. You'll fix it. You have full confidence in these yes, people, right? Okay. What was it like? I mean, it was really disheartening, wasn't it? You did all this work. Yes. And then how did you find out they were cutting you out? Well, they sent me an email, actually, right after I turned over the, the product. That's very personal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said they scrapped the product, yeah. um, the whole project, actually. Yeah. And, and um, so I figured, you know, I had some upfront money that was still due. Obviously, I can't take 5% of nothing if the project didn't go through. So yes. I figured I'd just follow up with the upfront money sometime in the near future in small claims, you know, get part of it. 
And then I found out that the project was going through um, and that Denzel was involved in... And the name of the project is what? Um, Living, well, it was called Living Voices Audio Bible. Now it's called uh, The Bible Experience. And it's out on the market right yes. now? Yes. How's it doing? It's um, the number one audio book. Uh, it's the number one audio Bible in history. Well, it's congratulations yeah. on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, how did, did they change it anyway to try to, you know, make it a little bit different for what you created? Um, well... In terms of versions, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different versions of the Bible. The, the basic concept was the same. Yeah. Right. What the plan of action was the same. They got another script writer to um, write it for um, a paid salary that was, you know, and yeah. without a piece of the action. And I believe that's one of the motivating factors because Paula not only um, helped produce this product, right. but she also had a piece of it going out. You know, as they were making money, she would make money because she was there from the inception. Right. And they found out they could pay somebody a couple thousand dollars and uh, write the script and they'd be gone. And that's what they did. And, and they did that in order to cut her out. What is the current status of the lawsuit right now? We have a trial date now. We were set, actually set to go uh, toward the end of this year, but it's now in February. And we, we, the trial was continued into February so we could see what the Christmas receipts will bring in. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, and, and I think that's Let the only way. make a lot of money. <laughs> no, I encourage my friends. They're like, I'm sorry, I bought three versions for my... Uh, Buy more. Yeah, <laughs> keep going. All right, well, yeah. listen, I wish you much success in your lawsuit. You're in good hands. Yes, I am. And that's not all state talking. But you're in good hands, and I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. I'm very glad both of you came here today with your clients because it points out one thing. It points out there's cases going on that discriminate against people. There's also cases going on where there's fraudulent cases like in Paula's case or breach of contract and a number of other counts. How is it that the Cochrane firm, when everybody thinks you've been discriminated against, whenever there's a breach of contract, why do they end up calling you guys first? That's that legacy, isn't it? It is. Yeah, so yes, what, other kind, Johnny, of, Johnny, yeah, what other kind of cases are you handling these days that are in the news? Essentially what we're looking for, what catches our radar is when we see an abuse of power. Mm -hmm. We get hundreds of calls, hundreds, every, every month. Really? <laughs> and uh, we only take a very few. How do you, you sit down at a committee and take, gather the information, decide what cases you're going to look at and do? Absolutely. We're trying to make the biggest impact that we can. And uh, what we're looking for are those cases that most elegantly articulate the abuse of power. You love the way you talk. I do. <laughs> that's what we're looking for. No, 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 that's not why. Elegantly articulates the abuse of power. That's we have regular case review committees. Yes. Uh, uh, we, we all, all of the lawyers actually are involved in our case review, and we talk about the cases that have come in, whether we like them or not, mm -hmm. what difference did they make, would they make in the long term for those cases have, that have less financial value, yeah. whether or not there's some overline or, 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 or bigger, bigger goal if we take the case. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things we discuss. We, we look for cases that will make a positive difference, and, and that's in medical malpractice cases. We take medical malpractice cases. Not a lot of them because with, with the limits on the the damages sure. that are unfairly placed on those cases, it's hard for us to take them um, when there's so many people out there that need our help. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what we do. We, we, um, and part of what, what we, we want to let the public know is that it doesn't really matter what kind of case you have. If you have a case where you were harmed by somebody else, call the Cochrane firm. More than any law, other law firm that comes to my mind right off the top of my head, when I see a law firm that that takes care of the injustices that happen every day. And they do. I remember the story of Geronimo Pratt. Yes. Absolutely. You know, they just keep on it, you know, and making sure that things are righted. And it's a damn shame that, that regulatory agencies, that the government doesn't act as quickly and swiftly like you do. We're a regulatory agency. Yeah, you regulate them. <laughs> That's what we are. How is Geronimo Pratt doing these days, by the way? He's doing a lot better than he was from 1971 right. to 1997. Uh, yeah. He's going back and forth to Africa. Uh, he's doing a lot of writing. Really? Uh, he's spending a lot of time with his family, and uh, he's involved in a lot of causes that matter to him. He's a missionary now. Is he? He's a missionary. He, well, I mean, he, he has a mission to, um, to, to write injustices. He's doing work over in Africa. He's trying to make a difference. Right. Um, with his life and with 
with what he received in, in compensation for what was taken from him. He is sharing that wealth. Okay. Do you, each one of you, do you have a particular passion for a particular type of case rather than I just want to help everybody? I, Brian loves police cases. I love all discrimination cases, but my, uh, the ones that make me the most angry are police brutality cases. Right. And oftentimes, because the police cars have the camera in the car, like we're going to be discussing this in another case, is it difficult to get those videos? It's difficult. Every aspect. Yeah of a police misconduct case yeah. is difficult. What goes through, do you think, in a policeman's mind? Not all of them, just a small minority of them. What do you think goes through their mind when they're acting so outrageous? They don't care? It can be a number of things. Mm -hmm. uh, most often what I see is fear. Yes. And uh, they're overwhelmed by a situation and they don't have the training uh, or the mental capacity uh, to sift through uh, what a reasonable person would yeah. do. The minority of cases, uh, it's more hatred yeah. than fear. Okay. And sometimes it's pure adrenaline. Yeah. Um, that's why the pr pr pursuit cases are so bad. They're right. so Absolutely. hyped up um, in this pursuit. They're, they're, they're all the, they're pumping, their blood's pumping. And then when this person gives up, it's so anticlimactic that they have, to, they have yeah. to do something. Yeah. They have to do something. And they, when they do something, that's where people get hurt and killed. Yes. And they have to learn, settle down. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious, do they, does the LAPD or the LA Sheriff's Department ever have your firm over and saying, this is the procedures you should follow, rather than just in the courtroom, so you can prevent problems? No, but I am a speaker, a regular speaker, uh, to law enforcement agencies. Good. And they call me uh, as the quote-unquote bad guy uh, to talk about what's going to happen if they cross the line. Oh, that's the kind <laughs> of speech you're giving. What about your passion, Randy? I, I really liked doing medical malpractice cases because there are so many wrongs that are done yeah. um, by doctors. Um, just some of them are mistakes. Some of them, well, this will take more time than yeah. you have for your sure. camera. But, you know, like there was a, there was a doctor who removed a, a, a lady's uh, whole kidney because it would have cost too much to fix her ureter. Mm -hmm. So he took the whole system out because she had endometriosis in one side yeah. and he would have had to do five or six procedures and he had what is called this capitation agreement where he only got paid right. a certain amount for that patient and so his goal was to make the most money. He had to take that system out because he knows he's going to have to fix the ureter more than once. Okay, listen, we're going to have you back again. Thank you for being on the show. I appreciate pleasure. it. It's Thank always you. a pleasure. Honor, Thank, Thank you. you so much. I want to thank you very much for watching our show. You can catch more of these shows at www.insiderexclusive.com. Come back again.